It's an interesting and potentially very useful new document on airway management in emergency medicine, published by the European Society of Emergency Medicine. I think it could be very helpful for departments wanting to get an emergency airway program going or people wanting to target some of the content of their training of their emergency teams or departments trying to get resources like video laryngoscopes or certain types of suction catheter and so on. So I'm going to go through this article and you'll notice that it is a statement by the European Society of Emergency Medicine on emergency airway management but with regards to the guidelines of the Society of Critical Care Medicine. So what happened is last year, the SCCM, that's the American Society of Critical Care Medicine, produced some guidelines for rapid sequence intubation in the, in the critically ill adult patient, which uh, were pretty good. There were a few things that I didn't feel entirely comfortable about, but as a general guideline, it was better than not having one. And I think it's interesting that... USEM's guideline is published as a response referring to the SCCM guidelines because clearly the Europeans feel that these are not entirely applicable to our setting or make best use of the evidence that's out there the way we in Europe have interpreted it. So they start with an introduction for emergency airway management and reference the SCCM guidelines and then come up with their recommendations. So under training, they want all team members who are regularly involved in emergency airway management to undergo airway courses, uh, which must encompass not only manual competencies, but also cognitive and mental strategies. So taking into account the human factors, which is obviously very good. They recommend checklist use um, for preparation and conduction of emergency airway management. And uh, that's something that I subscribe to, of course. And then in team composition, they recommend a team of at least two emergency physicians and two nurses, more if possible at the beginning with pre-allocated roles within the team. Now, I guess it depends on how you define emergency physician, whether this includes trainees, uh, but this obviously might be hard to achieve in some lower resourced or smaller departments. Certainly in my department, we'll have an emergency physician team leader and then an emergency uh, medicine doctor doing the intubation which may be a trainee, um, but where possible, there's an additional trained emergency physician supervising that trainee. All emergency physicians must be proficient in emergency airway management. That's a great statement. I've always agreed with that, and that's an argument for some departments in some countries where there's an element of disempowerment in emergency medicine in taking charge of the airway. So this USEM support that everyone must be proficient in EM can be certainly helpful for those places. And this must include skills in emergency front of neck access. So they're saying a team for advanced airway management in the case of anticipated or unexpected difficulties should be available. And this might in your hospital uh, be an anesthesia service that would make sense. And they recommend that for every emergency anesthesia or emergency airway management, there are alternative options uh, for rescue techniques like different supraglottic airways, and they should be discussed and prepared within the team and being ready for front of neck access, as well as having capabilities for fiber optic intubation, which I guess may be within the department or at least within the hospital. Positioning, they reference the semi-fowler position because this was recommended by the SCCM. If you don't know what that is, it's essentially semi-upright positioning. But they can't generally recommend it for emergency intubation because not all patients can be placed in this position, especially in pre-hospital where you may have trauma um, or by necessity of the environment, it might be hard to position the patient. And it may well be patients undergoing CPR or other examples of what they're calling situationally difficult airways where you won't have the luxury of sitting the patient up. SCCM recommended nasogastric tube placement before induction, although to be fair to SCCM, they did say where benefits outweigh risks. Uh, the USEM say that there's very limited evidence for this, very rare indications, and it might distract from more sound steps in the resuscitation process. So they don't recommend routinely doing NG tube decompression. Now onto pre-oxygenation. The recommendation by the SCCM was dependent on the severity of hypoxia 
but USEM recommend optimizing preoxygenation either using high flow nasal oxygen or if there's no contraindications, even a delayed sequence intubation using NIV. In essence, they want to optimize preoxygenation using a method that's appropriate for that situation and making it mandatory in the emergency department to adequately preoxygenate. And sometimes this may require pharmacologically assisted preoxygenation. In other words, if the patient's agitated and not tolerating the high flow or the NIV or whatever preoxygenation tool you're going to use, they recommend using ketamine because it will preserve respiratory drive and be relatively hemodynamically stable. And this process of using ketamine to facilitate good preoxygenation, often with NIV, is something well described and uh, often used in the emergency department. They want apneic oxygenation. So this is nasal cannula oxygen during paralysis and laryngoscopy uh, to be used whenever possible for prolongation of safe apnea times. There will be patients that, due to shunt physiology, won't benefit greatly from this, but as a routine part of the procedure, should always be done. If you've got a hypotensive patient, the SCCM guidelines say there's no evidence of vasopressors versus fluids. USEM takes a stronger stance in favor of vasopressors in that we know that the evidence for IV fluids in preventing hypotension is not convincing. I'd go a bit further and say there's evidence that IV fluids don't help peri-intubation hypotension in the non-hypovolemic patient. Whereas a hypotensive patient, if you start vasopressors, generally that's going to fix the hypotension. So they're saying in contrast to SCCM statements, they strongly recommend vasopressors during the peri-intubation period, especially in septic or bleeding patients or in those who are dehydrated like exhausted asthma patients. I think this is probably a little bit too much detail. Um, my practice would be to optimize my hemodynamic support based on the clinical setting. So yes, a septic shock patient would get vasopressors. A bleeding patient would get blood products. And so I think we should be titrating the treatment. Dehydrated patients should get fluids. But in essence, we need peri-intubation hemodynamic support. Resuscitate before you intubate. So now some stuff on induction agent and neuromuscular blocking agents. SCCM were non-committal, saying it didn't really matter what you give as an induction agent. USEM state that propofol has pronounced hypotensive properties, especially when combined with opioids, and they therefore explicitly do not recommend propofol for critically ill patients due to the availability of better alternatives. Now, I know some people that would be willing to have a strong debate about this. I feel that most emergency physicians are not going to be able to predict the effect of propofol on hemodynamics and will therefore have to assume it will drop the blood pressure in a critically ill patient and therefore are best advised to avoid it. Propofol in an appropriately tiny dose may be fine in some patients, but I would still argue that even in those patients, its effect can be unpredictable in terms of the degree of hypotension that it can cause. And so I agree with USEM, there are better alternatives. Atomidate and ketamine have nearly hemodynamically neutral properties, but atomidate potentially can cause adrenal suppression. There was certainly a recent paper suggesting an association with adverse outcomes with atomidate. That debate's probably going to go on for a while, but their pragmatic recommendation is to stick to ketamine with rocuronium. And this bit made me laugh. They've used the word rocketamine that I coined in a talk in 2013 <laughs> uh, with an accompanying image that uh, became a bit viral at the time. They're saying given the high therapeutic index of both drugs, a simple and easily re rememberable dose of 100 milligrams each may be a practical approach for inducing emergency anesthesia for most patients, keeping in mind that rocuronium requires high dosages for quick relaxation. I think this is a slightly dodgy oversimplification. Ketamine can drop the blood pressure in therapeutic doses in hypotensive or hypovolemic patients. If you have an obtunded hypotensive patient, I wouldn't be giving 1.5 milligrams of ketamine. I'd be giving less 0.5 to 1 milligrams of ketamine. So in a 70 kilo individual, I wouldn't be giving 100 milligrams. 
and the, adver- the, the converse is true in our experience with rock uranium in that 100 milligrams of rock uranium in an adult may be an underdose if you want a rapid effect. And of course, in critical care airway management, we are going for rapid onset neuromuscular blockade. So now in several retrieval services and in my emergency department, we're giving two milligrams per kilogram actual body weight of rock uranium to get rapid onset of paralysis. And certainly in a larger individual, 100 milligrams may be a lowish dose that's going to risk delayed onset of neuromuscular blockade. And if one is not bagging through that induction process, then you're going to get an inadequately paralyzed patient before the onset of apneic-induced desaturation. So it's nuanced, but simply saying 100 milligrams of each rock uranium and ketamine is a massive oversimplification that is not going to do justice to larger patients or unstable patients. It is saying here, in peri-arrest states, neuromuscular blocking agents might be considered as monotherapy, although the combination with low-dose ketamine is probably a better choice for ethical reasons. So I agree there probably are situations where you give only a neuromuscular blocker agent, but that is truly a peri-arrest, profoundly obtunded patient with some residual neuromuscular tone, if in doubt, give a small dose of ketamine. So SCCM guidelines, interestingly, do not cover video laryngoscopy, despite I think now overwhelming evidence for their superiority. They don't cover bougie use or the way to prepare suction. Apparently no entitled CO2 and other stuff like post-intubation period and quality management processes. And USEM think these need to be acknowledged. I agree. So here we go. Video laryngoscopy. For optimal first pass success, we recommend standard geometry video laryngoscopy as the primary strategy for most emergency intubations. Certainly in the pre-hospital and in-hospital services I'm involved with, that's our standard practice. And we do enjoy the luxury of first-pass success rates that are the highest in the published literature. So I definitely support this recommendation. Standard geometry blades allow you to practice your direct laryngoscopy technique, but give you the benefit of video laryngoscopy to ensure your first-pass success. And they recommend the so-called midline approach with video laryngoscopy. And again, this is well described. If in doubt, look at Levitan's work, but this enables visualization of familiar land works from uvula to posterior pharyngeal wall down to epiglottis. And therefore, you can easily find the vollecular and so on. So midline approach, standard geometry video laryngoscopy. I fully support that. Bougie assisted intubation for best first pass success. Again, we could debate the literature, but the experience of high performing services as using this strategy as part of primary intubation works very, very well in emergency department and pre-hospital teams. In emergency medicine, we should routinely prepare for massive regurgitation during emergency airway management by keeping a large bore suction catheter at hand. A suitable example would be the decanto suction catheter and training the SALA technique, suction-assisted laryngoscopy and airway decontamination technique, something that we make sure all of our emergency physicians are trained in. Continuous end tidal CO2 should be measured during any assisted ventilation, and this should be quantitative. No trace is wrong place. You want sustained capnograph waveform to confirm tracheal intubation. During the post-intubation period, they recommend continuous monitoring of vital signs, including entitled CO2 and sedation levels, and immediately managing any complications such as hypotension, hypoxemia, or difficulties with ventilation. So good that they're stressing that it's not just about the intubation, it's about the post-intubation management, and all emergency airway clinicians should be competent in managing the first period of post-intubation ventilation and sedation. In conclusion, they acknowledge that several recent studies improve the evidence base in emergency airway management, and that should be included in our practice. And they're advocating for emergency physicians to take responsibility for emergency airway management and are the primary individuals to carry it out. Emergency airway management courses should include the theoretical, practical, and mental cognitive content. Three things are considered to be crucial in this guideline. Prevention of desaturation, prevention of hypotension, and high first pass success rate. Those are certainly quality indicators that we measure and report regularly in our own department. 
and I recommend it to others as a key part of their quality improvement programs. They also consider mental and cognitive training an essential part of education. So to me, that includes team training of the doctors and nurses in the emergency department, training together in situ according to a standard operating procedure. So there you have it. That is the European Society of Emergency Medicine statement on emergency airway management, including several recommendations for the system that should take place, giving support to emergency departments, having trained emergency physicians, having enough emergency physicians and nurses, having the right equipment, attending the right courses, and making best use of the current available evidence for critical care airway management. Take a look in the video description to get links to full text of both the Society of Critical Care Medicine guideline and the USEM statement. Feel free to leave comments about what you think of these guidelines, whether it affects your practice and uh, anything that you wish USEM or SCCM had added. Thanks for listening.